on behalf of our festival co-directors namita gokhale and william dalrymple festival producer sonjoy roy and all of us at team work arts i welcome you back for another session of jaipur literature festivals words are bridges our session today is prapatan trilogy rita kothari and abhijit kothari in conversation with pradeep sara k n munshi's historical trilogy comprising patan ni prabhuta gujarat no nath and raj adhiraj has long been part of cultural memory and literary history rita and abhijit kothari's classic translation of the patan trilogy reveals to non gujarati readers how munshi's philosophy of gujarati asamita finds a strong resonance in today's times they discuss the craft and nuances of bringing the past to life in another language with scholar and translator tridip sarat whose english rendering of govardhan ram tripathi's saraswati chandra remains a benchmark of quality rita kothari is a professor of english at ashoka university a distinguished translator kothari is also a leading theoretician of translation studies and internationally known for books such as translating india the cultural politics of english and a multilingual nation kothari is a multilingual scholar and her translation interests are manifest in the way she moves between various languages through research and pedagogy she also writes extensively on language politics partition and the literary and social traditions of gujarat and sindh abhijit kothari combines sociology business and management in his research and teaching he lives in ahmedabad where he runs his own business tridip sarad is a scholar writer and translator who works on the intellectual and cultural history of modern gujarat and the gandhian intellectual tradition His recent works include a critical edition of Gandhi's autobiography, My Experiments with Truth, in both Gujarati and English, The Diary of Manu Gandhi, uh, and a compilation, The Power of Nonviolent Resistance. Before we move on to our next session, we request you all to follow us on our handles JLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on all our upcoming sessions. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues. You can find us on our YouTube channel Jaipur Lit Fest JLF and on our Facebook page JLF Lit Fest. We now present Patan Trilogy, Rita Kothari and Abhijit Kothari in conversation. It gives me immense pleasure to be talking to two people that I am fortunate to consider as my friends, uh, um, scholars, translators, but. Now, for me, what's what's very very important is that these are two people that one considers friends, fellow travelers, people that you go to in time of trouble or when you really want to have fun. So, Abhijit and Rita, thank you. Um, always a pleasure to to to, to be with you, um, even if it is through this you know, seductive charms of these Zoom calls. Uh, uh, um, before we really go into looking at the translation and 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 munshi and what it means uh, abhijit um, let me begin with you uh, probably you and i both read uh, munshi uh, in our early teens uh, uh, by the time we were 12 13 these were the books that came our way and we were deeply enamored of of the prose uh, uh, we were taken in by and carried with the flow of the story of the characters of the events that took place kind of a ceaseless um journey through this trilogy is something that i remember uh, at a very young age uh, what do you i mean uh, did you have similar experience when you read it um, uh, and and what is it that one remembers of that you're absolutely right you're absolutely right it was in the early teens that i read munshi uh perhaps i would i studied in english medium missionary school and munshi was my first foray into serious gujarati literature probably the first author that i read in gujarati and i found him i was absolutely fascinated i mean uh 
it made far more sense. It resonated much more than reading the Count of Monte Cristo or Rob Roy or something like that. Mm. You know, the, the Bonapartists and whatever didn't really make sense to someone in the in the teens in India, whereas one could so easily identify with Gujarat and Patan and, you know, Kambhat and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. So, and yes, it's, they're beautiful. I mean, they're very racy, extremely interesting novels with all the elements, valor and romance and all of that. So I, I was a fan. Yes. I was a big yeah, fan. I, I, I. But Rita, I mean, you know, we were both innocent when we read Munshi. In some ways, <laughs> right? Uh, you were not. Uh, you came to it uh, much later, probably. Uh, uh, you came to it uh, when the context had changed. You had done substantial amount of work in terms of both translation, but literary theory, cultural practices, the politics of it all, and its placement in, in what modern Gujarat or, or our Gujarat has been. So your experience and the filters through that you read or that you were told that this is the right way to read would have been very different. Um, yeah. So, uh, but did it charm you um, apart from all of that? And... It charmed me when I actually got into it. Mm -hmm. The moment I'm distant from it, it doesn't charm me. Mm -hmm. But when I'm actually involved in it, it's difficult not to be drawn into its raciness, its political intrigues. Uh, and Munshi is very theatrical. So every chapter ends on a particular note where, I mean, I'm, I'm a big ardent watcher of cinema, of theater and, you know, crime shows and detective shows. So a strong narrative allures me. Uh, so yes, it, it did that for me when I was reading it. And then the moment I would step back and I would think like, what the hell was that about? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, it, it's strange that it never got made into serious cinema. I mean, I, I think, you know, um, you know they, they made attempts to, to, to film Saraswati Chandra in a, in a kind of a hopeless kind of a way. But what really lent it, should have lent itself to great Gujarati or Hindi cinema where these um, Munshi novels, which never got there, got there. But, you know, um, that's... Um, but, you know, talking about the prose uh, and, and the, the raciness, uh, Abhijit, if you could actually read uh, something from, I mean, one passage from one of the trilogies, one of the novels, and maybe a passage uh, uh, of the same in your translation. Uh, okay. So the, the audience gets a sense of what, uh, you know, that cadence of language that one uh, wants to capture. All right. All right. I think there's um, the very first novel of the trilogy that is uh, The Glory of Patan. In Gujarati, it is Patani Prabhuta. Uh, there is this passage where this fanatic Jain monk, Anand Sui, meets Manjal Mehta, the real protagonist, if you like, of the trilogy, for the first time. Just uh, read the passage in Gujarati. This is Anand Suri uh, addressing Munjala. Namaskar Mantri Maharaj, Kai Anand Suri Betho. Early Vakat Munjal ne Jota, then a Kai Kai Vicharo Avea. Munjal ne Lok Priyata, then a Vishara Vyapar, then a third Rajaniti. Dushmano ne Mode, Sambarato, Minar Devi Sateteno Sambar. Abadu Tarat, then a Managar Tariyavi. Ebada Vicharo Roki, then a Mantri Satevato Arandi. Chandra Vatima Bada Kushi Manche, Nagar Shetno Patravancho. Ha. Jara Gambi Ravaja Mantriya Kayu. But in the Mani Kabar Kem Nati Laki, Masi Kem Che. Mu Avio Tareto Halat Nabari Hati. Bolo, Kem Avasho. Pamajana Shua Tareman of Fusad Nati. Mu Abna Kama Vigna Nakwa Nati Avio, Madat Karvavacho. Mantri Jara Tiras Karbari was your name over. Jin Bagwani Kurbati Guru Devnu Vachanche. Ke Asamae Mare Hate, an ek Kario Tavana Larate Lakayache. પણ ખરું જુઓ તો એક જ કામ કરો મંત્રીએ જરા બેદરકારીથી કહ્યું મહેરબાની કરી પાટણના રાજ્યતંત્રમાં ચંદ્રાવતીનું તોફાન આણશો નહીં ધીમેથી દ્રઢતાથી મુંજાલે કહ્યું અને જસ રીડ ધીસ ઇન ઇંગ્લિશ નાઉ ધ 
Namaskar, respected minister, Anand Suri said. At this first sight of Munjal, a flurry of thoughts raced through the Jati's mind. Munjal's popularity, the expanse of his business network, his firm administration, his relations with Minal Devi as reported by his enemies. Pushing these thoughts aside, he began, everyone is happy in Chandravati. Did you read the Nagar Sheikh's letter? Yes, the minister replied gravely. But why hasn't he mentioned his mother? How is Masi? When I left, her condition was delicate. Tell me why have you come? You know, I don't have much time these days. I have not come to be an impediment, but to aid your work. The minister smiled derisively, but did not comment. I am destined to carry out important tasks with the grace of Lord Mahavir and the blessings of Gurudev. Carry out only one task. Do not bring the turmoil of Chandravati to the administration of Pajan, Munjal said with gentle firmness. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you, Abhijit. You know, um, Rita, um, there are two, two things that I um, that the passage talks about, but one thing that, that this is, you know, a very, very elliptical reference to Munjal and Minal Devi. Uh, you know, these, the, the women characters of all the three novels are unlike anything that Gujarat wrote before and after. After we understand, because it, you know, M.K. Gandhi happened to Gujarat and, and, and uh, you know, things uh, turned, took a different kind of a turn. But even post-independence, you do not find uh, women characters in, in the Gujarati writing, the Bhadralok writing, of the strength, the confidence, the allure, uh, even to use the capacity for transgression uh, and the willingness for it that Munshi's women have. So, the, you see that the thing is, Munshi is, uh, sexuality is quite important to Munshi. Uh, and even when you kind of read his personal life, his autobiographies, the idea that, you know, there are, there are marriages and there are relations which have been forged through certain tradition, but we don't need to be, we don't need to be constantly bound by them. You get that sense even in Munshi's personal choices, right? Uh, now the thing is, this is really, a male journey and a male endeavor as far as his real life is concerned. But what you do get from the novels is a certain full-throated <clears throat> sexuality, which gets actually projected, in fact, far more onto the women than on the men. And it's the women actually who draw them into it. Uh, and I think that makes romance really, really intense in Munshi. And you're right, you at a time when he was writing, there was nothing like that that preceded it. And even in the period that succeeded, while you did have strong women characters like Dhiruben Patel would have them and so on, or Kundanika Kapadia would have them in the 60s and 70s and so on. But given the fact that these are women in the courts of Patan and they would be expected to, you know, to be kind of genteel, they are far from it not only are they more kind of sexually alive, in fact, there is a passage in Lord and Master of Gujarat and Manjari is clearly saying, you're not even looking at me, can't you see what my desire is? Uh, but you will also see the sophisticated political intrigue and understanding that women are capable of. Mm -hmm. And I think all that is a, is a very, very interesting combination. Now, one may well argue, Tridip, that after all this, what they still want to marry, and you know whether they, we can think of this as a certain kind of a feminist uh, position, and one can one can have a different view on the subject. But be that as it may, I do believe that Munshi is actually tapping uh, all the elements that can work for a bestseller. Right, uh, uh, Abhijit. Before we. Can, do, you, do you want to read that passage of Manjri if it's uh, handy uh, uh, with yeah, you and, 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 and um, because I, I think 
Uh, all right, I'll read it both in Gujarati and in English. Uh, I hope we have the time though. Ashu Karacho, Tamne Akonati, Shama de Ribaocho, who carry me Tansu to Maroji Jayashe, Tamne Radech and a Bachi Bachi, Kate Druske Druske Kai Radavamari. Kake Ash of the Samblane Samjo, Swastati Rakshit Radema for Nabujai Agladi. The Kudina Manjri Paseado, then a Hathmanidi, Barjoriti then Muru Uchukaru, Nemuk for Kam de Mikalame Lakaili, Dipili Pitanamachi. तेने तेने हाथ मार ली दूं छाती सरसू चांपी हूं तेना पर चुंबन और वर्षा गया मंजरी बोली नहीं मुंगे मोड़े सुखनु सिंचन करियो थोड़ी बार है बे हाथ है काक ने तमाचा मारया मारो जीव जतो हो तो ते नोता चोता मारो जीव तो ते कितनी बार जो जतो जो हो तेनो कहीं नहीं तो मुरक खती मुरक काक ने छाती Topan, the Maridasi. The Majatia lak chori didi. Baji, a pap tayu. Venu prayas chitker. Shoo. Ah, pay kaket and a hat malidi. Kaumudi, ami versavi day. Vanaspati, a hershana de gaganda jagu. A grani bilaro jari mati nikri. Durti joiro. And a tori vare daponti doku dunavi. Potani strine. Man of jatini murkaini vat keva. Timidagle, chalio veo. I think it's beautiful. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, I think we've done a reasonably good job. You say in English also. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Are you blind? Why are you torturing me? I have been pining for you. I can hardly bear it. Are you heartless? But she, but she, she said and she sighed. Kark heard the words. Their meaning dawned upon him. These words pierced the armor of restraint that he had donned. His heart was aflame with desire. He leapt to Manjari's side and held her in his arms. Firmly, he lifted her face. He could read Kamdev's divine script written on it. He held her face with both hands, brought it close to him, and showered kisses on it. Manjari did not speak a word. She just silently drank in the pleasure. After a while, she slapped Kak. Could you not see that it was killing me? And what about the number of times it was killing me? I was a fool, a fool. In penitence, Manjari rested her head on Kark's chest. You, a fool? I thought it was I who was uncultured, Kark laughed. And yet I am your slave. And yet you just kicked me. Bhatji, that was a sin. For which you must do penitence. How? Like this, he grabbed hold of her. The moonlight showered its affection. The forest air filled with sounds of pleasure. A wild cat emerged from the bushes at a distance and looked on. Then, shaking its head wisely, it retreated to relate to its wife the follies of human beings. What a fine translation, the two of you. Um, it's it's his joy to, to, to hear that. Thank you. Um, you know, um, it's the kind, I mean, we know that these three novels are about politics and statecraft and formation of the Gujarati uh, state and the at the particular period in which they are written, um, uh, or, or the period that they refer to, uh, which is really the advent and the hegemony or domination of the Jain worldview, which really gets onto uh, to Gujarati mind. But despite that, the kind of uh, the kind of landscape, both religious, social, economic, and and that of the statecraft that he is able to, to, to do, uh, where statecraft in some ways is a means, um, is a justification of itself. It's not sometimes leading to a grand design and sometimes it is. I don't think Gujarati has anything comparable in terms of its understanding of the political culture through which states emerge, feudal power, created its own uh, foundations. Uh, it's remarkable. Um, yeah, and yet yet one may, it, we know it is a fantastic Gujarat, that this yeah. is not Gujarat for real yes. in some yeah. sense. Uh, we also, we know that the storyteller in Munshi uh, gains a lot of precedence over Munshi the historian. And it's quite interesting how Munshi actually 
keeps kind of switching these hats mm -hmm. and how they also bleed into each other. Mm -hmm. but, but what is interesting is that the powerful story that he tells, which he does not claim to be history, mm -hmm. Gujarat actually swallowed it as both story and history. Uh, it became for the readers, you know, the, the norm that Gujarat is. And in fact, I, you know, that was actually one of the things that motivated me, apart from the temptation of working with Abhijit together on this, which was, which was to say that when I saw a political scientists writing about Munshi and I would look at the bibliography and I would not find his fiction anywhere. And I thought that Munshi's actually impact is entirely through, through this fiction. Uh, and the affective sort of a place that Munshi has in Gujarat, in the memory of Gujarat is entirely through this trilogy. And I felt that we needed to kind of understand what the power of narratives is uh, and what they managed to achieve. And therefore, it's important to kind of translate this. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that you're right about statecraft and political administration, but there are also very interesting tensions, cracks, beach, beach, may, right? In the, mm -hmm. for instance, there's one particular dialogue where the question is how inevitable is violence mm -hmm. for the state? Mm -hmm. And it's a dialogue that's happening between Kark and a Jain monk. Mm -hmm. uh, or the question of, in the expansionist plans of Munjal Mehta, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you let go of Gujarat and have a broader vision, or do you stay with Gujarat and firm that up, and then think of a broader vision? And this idea of the broader vision, which is sometimes the novel uses the word Aryavrat, mm -hmm. but it is an unstable category in the novel. It become, it gets discussed, it gets rejected, accepted, and then sidelined. And Gujarat emerges as the more kind of a real entity than the idea of an Akhand Bharat or an Aryabhat. Although Munshi is writing about those things in his other histories. So I think those are also very fascinating sort of connections across his different writings. You know, but um, it's interesting um, what it says about us as Gujarati people, right? Um, that um, we're, you know, quite often not willing to or capable of uh, making this distinction between history and fact, between fantasy and desire, uh, between uh, uh, between what could have been and what what is, uh, and I think that that plays a great. I mean, the kind of uh, political culture that we've developed and the kind of attitude to past that we've developed. Also, in our contemporary readings of things like Mushi or even other cultural texts, are very much part of the way Gujaratis read literature. And, you know, I think it would be interesting that both of you should maybe reflect on how, how we read um, uh, not just Munshi, but other things. Because you've, Rita, worked on large number of texts and you brought actually texts which are recessive to our uh, Gujarati mind mm -hmm. to the fore. And mm -hmm. Abhijit, you you know, you know, you represent the good Gujarati. Uh, uh, While well, I represent the other one, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think... Uh, no, I must uh, be only. That, yeah. <laughs> no, and that, no, you are, you know, you're the theoretician. <laughs> No, Rita, please. I mean, I think yeah, you know sure. your, your 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 insights into the way we read is are very crucial. So, I think the first word that comes to my mind, Trudeep, as I listen to you, is actually sentimentalism. Mm -hmm. I think there is a, the reading publics in Gujarat is I think very is mediated through a huge amount of sentimentalism rather than. Uh, rather than a critical sort of an approach. And I'm not here actually making some loaded judgment about one or the other, but just, just the way whether, you know, whether it is your literary establishment critics or ordinary readers talk about something, you will notice certain kinds of phrases. You will notice language in a particular way. And, you know, Munshi Sahib, 
મુનશી સાહેબે એવું સરસ લખ્યું છે ને એવી સરસ વાત કીધી છે દેર ઇઝ અ સેન્સ ધેટ મુનશી હેઝ ગિવન અસ એન એક્ઝોલ્ટેડ નેરેટિવ એન્ડ ઇટ ઇઝ હાઉ કાઇન્ડ ઓફ હિમ ટુ ડુ ધેટ sorry to interrupt but i do believe that uh, the kind of valorous gujarati and munjal mehta is good at battles and he's a baniya and kaag bhat is good at battles and he's a brahmin and this is not the reality of gujarat mm-hmm. so there's a lot of wishful thinking i know uh, that the gujarati is happy to believe this stuff as 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 we say we are a marital race not a martial race <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, uh, so, yeah. so i mean just the fact trudeep that the most popular forms of or the most standard forms of if you like criticism are the ones that are appearing in columns of gujarati newspapers right mm-hmm. rather than uh, a certain kind of sharp trenchant critique of somebody who would have done people are not talking about you know pe chandrakant topi wala ni peli chopdi vaachvi joiye on on govardhan ram tripathi or on munshi this is not the way people talk about what they would talk about is <clears throat> ajay falana e emna column e us saras aswad karavyo kavita no right that it, it they introduced us to the appreciation of the poem so in that sense i feel like there is a i'm not talking here of some exceptional cases of people working in gujarati literature departments we are not talking of you know bharat mehta and we are not talking of academics like that but mm-hmm. by and large for a large number of people the idea of literature is that of almost the 60s 70s mode of critical appreciation mm-hmm. and that critical appreciation is to is to say that show us how our joy of reading this poem or novel can mm-hmm. be enhanced by bhasha ni samruddhi batao humne and bhasha ni samruddhi thi kai rite so the the fact that the bhasha can be samruddh but it can also do other kinds of work that it mm-hmm. may have other kinds of ideological intent is something that people will never talk about mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and it is not it's that's not the way they are reading it yeah even mm-hmm. when abhijit and i translated you know diasporic gujaratis relatives friends of relatives and so on so many people bahut saras kaam karyo tumhe rita ben munshi sahib ne tumhe anuvad karya and it was strange i mean i have talked about this in another lecture i gave recently that although i had translated joseph mcconn's angadia i have translated women writers i have translated all kinds of things but i have not i have not actually been quite patronized in this way and told that you know you did such good service by doing it and i had to say to somebody i said jane munshi sahib ne main jamwa bola hai wo to mai ko it was structured in such a way that i was at his service and i talked about this elsewhere in a talk where i say you know you talk of what is the role of gender in the in the in the act of translation and we think gender has to do with women characters and male characters and male translate it's not about the body it always lies elsewhere it lies it gets displaced on to the way it gets constructed elsewhere i think i when abhijit and i were translating i mean he was weeping when manjuri died i wasn't yeah. because i found manjuri pretty casteist also you know she was like so so snobby she just made she wanted to marry a brahmin and only this kind of brahmin and i, I didn't have much patience with her and when she died he was weeping and i was i thought okay you know yeah. but <laughs> what have i got myself into yes it is, was, <laughs> it is when i was asked by this journal told by this journalist kerita ben bahut saro karyo tumhe bahut moto yogdan apyo munshi sahib ne anuvad karya at that time i felt like some a gender role had taken gender labor had taken place mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um abhi ji did um You no know, just slightly deviating from munshi but if both of you were to reflect on what occupies the gujarati cultural space today i mean are there literary texts or have we moved away because this is an important thing because 
Uh, you know, go, you know, it ties up with what you said about how we look at literary appreciation and not criticism, the literary culture, the academic culture, but uh, are texts important for us anymore? Or are we, you know, I don't, you know, uh, the two of you are far more uh, acute in terms of your um, reading of Gujarati uh, text than I, I mean, I'm, I'm stuck somewhere in the 19th century, so. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that I, I, I personally feel that uh, to a large extent what Rita said is that today it's mostly columns in newspapers and magazines that uh, seem to matter mm. rather than the, rather than any serious text. Mm. It's also true that uh, a fair bit of uh, Melodrama and sentimentalism is much more popular. And I suppose maybe that is the case in other languages also. I do not know that for sure. But it's certainly far more popular in Gujarat. Uh, so stark depictions uh, in novels, etc. I remember Rita and I were talking about it in this is a statement that was made at the Gujarat Sahitya Parishad at some stage or the other in the early days uh, when Dalit literature was Gujarat, in Gujarati was being written and somebody said, Haan, Dalit to chai, pan Lalit chai ke mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's shocking. Mm -hmm. So to a large extent, the both the establishment, if you like, and the popular public mm -hmm. uh, is looking for a very limited kind of... Uh, input, if you like, uh, so only books of a certain nature seem to be read. And that's unfortunate. So, so Radhi, if we want some kind of a smattering, some sampling of what mm. is being read, right? mm. I mean, I would, I would imagine this shelf at Crossword, for instance, and very often I take a picture at the mm. shelf that is immediately available. Mm -hmm. And you will find a Kajaloza right there. Um, yeah, and you will find Sudha Murthy, mm. uh, Dollar Wow. She's a Gujarati writer, right? I mean, Sudha <laughs> Murthy is now. <laughs> <laughs> then you will find, you, you may find a Chetan Bhagat or you may find even Meluha, uh, the Meluha series by Amish Tripathi. Mm. You will find, again, a lot of quasi-spiritual books of, mm. you know, how-to books of how to be peaceful and how to be... Uh, and then you will find how to invest, mm. right? What the, mm. about stocks and shares and the right kind of investment. Now, if you're looking at this entire, this motley sort of combination mm. together, what have you got there? You've got basically the promise of a good life, mm -mm -mm. right? Mm. You've got, you've got mm. books that tell you how to invest your money. So mm. if you're looking at something like Dharma, Kam, Moksha, mm. in some sense, I think they are all represented in this mm. much. Now, the idea that literature, as Munshi Premchand says in 1930s in the progressive, first progressive writers union, he said, Sahitya wo hai jisme beche ni ho, sangarsh ho, or gati ho, right? Mm -hmm. So, ye jo cheeze hai, sangarsh, gati, beche ni, matlab ye to aap bhooli jau. This mm -hmm. is not the credo that you will, you will find in, uh, mm -hmm. so you may have, we may have seen shades of it in what is called Gandhian literature. Mm -hmm. And that's again a very interesting nice. combination of mm -hmm. how that manifest during mm -hmm. that period. But since then, and especially now, you don't you don't see that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is um, specifically to you, Rita. Given given what you describe, um, and given what you do, and given what I do, uh, uh, but but more more intensely, you do. I mean, the way you work with text, teach them, um, uh, try to bring other voices, sensibilities into conversation about reading a text. How does one, I mean, what is the dharma that you perform uh, when you do that in Gujarat? I know that you're not in Gujarat right now and mm -hmm. that's a comment, but, uh, um, um, but when you, when, for all these decades that you taught in Gujarat mm -hmm. uh, and engage with Gujarati writing, how does one do that? So does, does one find one's 
uh, center outside of that? Uh, I don't know whether I found a center, Tradeep, but I think I created for myself my own archive of things that I want to read and I want to write about and translate and bring them to teaching. Uh, so let me kind of give you an example. I'm teaching a course in Indian literature here at Ashoka University. And I was, I've been doing the text Angariyat for some weeks now. And yesterday's class was entirely about the word Vyavar. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very interesting. Uh, you would not associate the word Vyavar with a Dalit novel. Mm -hmm. First of all, there are hardly Dalit novels, really. They're Dalit autobiographies and testimonies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, you've got a character like T. Ho, mm -hmm. who's a vankar in Angariyat, and he says, Dando ne to jya bando hai, jya banda hai. Mm -hmm. And then T. Ho goes to do this auction in other, another village. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that this is a Dalit community of Gujarat, which of course as vankars have done relatively well compared to certain other Dalit communities. But the fact that his language is also very much like the Bepar language of the rest of the state, right? Mm -hmm. Which makes him, which makes it so interesting. And then you've got someone like Bhavan Bhagat in that novel who uses Bepar in another sense, which is to say that, you know, let's not take a more aggressive path of fighting or the legalistic path. But Bepar manj baat hai jati ho hai, to pachi badda na sara wana tha shay. And so this idea of doing business, forming relations, bypassing, if you like, a certain kind of an aggressive politics or confrontational politics, but negotiation. Uh, so to my mind, actually, they, these, are, these are archives that I'm building for myself. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure whether mainstream Gujarati literary establishment would have any sympathy with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would be interested in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that as somebody who sometimes sort of talks about Gujarat outside Gujarat, mm -hmm. I think it is important that I bring that nuance to, to it. And translation helps me do that because mm -hmm. it helps me engage with it and it becomes a mode, right? It is not to me a consequence only. Translation becomes a mode of doing it. Mm. Uh, so I think this idea of forming and unforming and reforming a center, <clears throat> it's, an, it's an ongoing process, right? Mm. And which is why even though sometimes people who are selling a lot, who have big names, and they'll say, Rita Ben, please, atlo anu, anu I, would, I, I will not do that. The fact that I did Munshi also is a little uneasy matter for me. I mean, I do carry mixed feelings about it, mm -hmm. but Munshi was an exception in the larger archive that I was, that I've been trying to understand. But that intimacy has also helped me to kind of understand what that subliminal sort of layer has been in the readers, in the history of reading practice in Gujarat. In, 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 you know, it's fascinating that you speak of unease and I don't want to labor because I know that you've written about it, talked about it, uh, um, but you know, um, I think it's important that two of you reflect on this. Now that Gujarat's political culture is triumphant in, mm. in, in ways in which it has it had yeah. not been since Gandhi's time, yeah. in some ways, uh, 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 and that we are not feeling remorseful about uh, who we are, we're not any less confident about our, our politics and, and its efficacy. Do you think? Um, now, Munshi is no longer required as a cultural text um, for us, and that you know we need to to move ahead or or, or just you know do without one. Mm. Abhijit, would you like to go first? It's a bit like asking that now that you've got a twenty-story building, do you or do you need not need the foundation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, here is a structure. You know, here is somebody who understands structure speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's my engineering training. I can't. Help. I know. I know. I know. I get it. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I, I. I think it's very, very profound what you said. Uh, so it uh, remains a foundational text. It, there is no doubt about that. I think the 
way the politics of Gujarat is today and uh, the way it's been formed, the way the people have accepted a certain standard, all of that, which is not the only person, but there has been a very significant role that has been played out there. And once that's done, and then you are already built the structure and you want to, you know, change the position of a window here and there or add some curtains and remove some furniture, I think uh, you can do what you want. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I have to say. Rita? Yeah, I think I would frame my response slightly differently, Tridip. I don't think mm -hmm. Gujarat needs Munshi or Munshi needs Gujarat, but we need both Munshi and Gujarat for us to arrive at a better understanding and the, to get the, understand the dialectic between the two. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in the last sort of a, uh, the last section of the trilogy, we've discussed in great detail the idea of Asmita, right? Which mm -hmm. Munshi is the mm -hmm. architect of. And what are the different ways in which the idea of Asmita emerges in this novel and whose Asmita it is. And uh, I think there are two things I want to kind of put out there. One is that uh, the idea that we could, we, could, we could retain the terms of discourse and still demand of the world what we want to have from the world that a certain false idea of cosmopolitanism, which if it dislodges me from where I stand, which Munjal Mehta says, Kya mare ena mate mare jhopdi mare jawanathi devi. I don't want to give up the hut that I occupy. Yeah. The idea that I have the purchasing power and I will make sure that Domino's gives me wedge pizzas and Pizza Hut gives me wedge pizzas. And I will make sure that the cruise I go to serves me this kind of food there is a sense of demanding the world to do it because we do have, we do hold that power, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we need to understand that as to where, not only, not just to think where is it coming from, but we need to understand what its articulation is. Mm -hmm. And the second point I want to make, and I think which is a more kind of politically contingent and an urgent point, which is that you know, when you're looking at, for instance, the entire ecology of the trilogy, you will, you will not find uh, forms of mobility. You will not mm. find uh, a poor person. Mm. And you, you will not find a caste mobility. You will not find people going across boundaries of, of caste or religion. But in fact, caste actually becomes pretty significant. Yeah. And I think it is a very under research aspect of the trilogy. Of yeah. yeah. Not only is this world upper caste, it is so, it is Brahmin, not just Brahminic. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I, the fact that Asmita. Just that unfortunately, you need. You, you need Rajput rulers, unfortunately. But, huh, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this idea that. So Asmita is a frozen concept. Asmita can only sustain itself when all else has been refied and all forms of mobility have been held in abeyance. I think Munshi helps us understand that. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Abhijit. I think that's profound that Asmita is a frozen concept and, and it requires a certain kind of mind and a certain kind of community life to, to create ideas which then are frozen in time uh, and, 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 and through which we derive some kind of sustenance and we continue to do so. Fascinating as always to talk with you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Tridip. Thank you, Tridip, Rita and Abhijit for that beautiful conversation. Thank you for your insights into the art and craft of translation. If you all enjoyed the session, please do share with your friends and on your social media pages. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We promise to be back next week for another session of Jaipur Literature Festival's Words Abridges. Have a great evening.